Hello everyone, this is Michael Houston with the Iowa Civil War Images Group. And first I want to apologize to anyone that was on our Zoom presentation earlier. Unfortunately, we had someone that got into our Zoom presentation and, and kind of sabotaged it by posting some inappropriate things. But I've decided that we are not going to be deterred and we're gonna take a negative and hopefully turn it into a positive. I'm gonna go ahead and start here with my opening slide. Uh, this slide, uh, has a lot of images that I really enjoy. Uh, the background of this slide is actually the header for the Iowa Civil War Images Group. And in the background, you'll see the soldiers of Company H, 7th Iowa Infantry. And the boys of Company H were actually all men who enlisted or had a residence in Washington County at the time of their enlistment. And this picture was taken in February of 1863. And the unfortunate thing is, if, if you count the men in this picture, there are actually only 39 men uh, at the time that they enlisted, the size of their company would have been a, a hundred. Uh, but by the time this particular picture was taken, they would have already been through the battles of Forts Henry and Donaldson, uh, through Belmont, Shiloh, and Corinth. And as you can see, they had taken pretty severe casualties as they only had about 40% of their company remaining. The image on the left is that of Henry W. Shaver of Company F of the 1st Iowa Cavalry. Henry claimed his residence as Amish, Iowa, which for those folks that are local uh, to the Iowa City area, uh, you, would, you would be familiar with the town today as Joetown. The image on the right is a picture from my own personal collection. And this is a picture of John W. Morton. And I'll be sharing some information about John W. Morton here uh, as I proceed through my slide presentation. This is a little bit about me. Uh, in our live feed, I had Dave Jackson introduce me, but my name is Michael Houston. I'm a lifelong Iowan and a resident of Wellman, Iowa. I graduated from Iowa State in 2004 with a degree in agricultural education. I did my student teaching at Eddyville Blakesburg and, and had my teaching certificate. But through some internships, I, I decided to get involved in agriculture and uh, I've been in the seed business ever since. Most of my spare time is dedicated to my children's activities and studying history with a focus on the Civil War. And most recently, I had an article that was published in the Military Images Magazine titled The Pride of Washington County. And after that uh, article was published, I even had an interview with KCRG TV9. So this is my family. Uh, on the left are my wife, Sarah, and I's three children. We have twins that are 12 years old, Caden and Adeline, and our dog, Cubby, who's 29. And the baby of the group is Afton, who's seven and in second grade. Uh, you'll see there a, a picture of my son, Caden, and he's dressed as a, a soldier in Company H of the 7th Iowa, so dressed in the New York State jacket and very similar to those soldiers that you saw on my opening slide. Uh, our dog, Cubby, sporting a hardy hat, and then uh, my wife and I. So I, I jokingly say that all the boys in the family, uh, myself, my son, and the dog included all, enjoy uh, dressing up in some unique outfits. The girls, uh, that's really not their cup of tea. The following is a list of all the topics that I'm hoping to cover uh, in this presentation today. I'm not gonna go through those in great detail right now, but one thing that I do plan to do on each of the slides is tell a story about the soldiers that, that are pictured. And the soldier that's pictured here in the background of this slide is Samuel Rickey. And Samuel claimed his residence as Richmond, Iowa when he enlisted in Company H of the 7th Iowa. And I love this image for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, it was one of the very first images that I added to my collection. Uh, number two, he's a local guy. Um, and, and unfortunately, number three, he was a soldier who, who lost his life while he was fighting uh, to preserve the Union. And Samuel's pictured here wearing what's called a New York State jacket and holding a Model 1842 uh, musket. And Samuel is buried at the Pilotburg Cemetery. And it's a cemetery that I'd always spent time at. Uh, I always knew there was a gravestone there for Samuel, and I was always kind of drawn to it. But I was under the impression, actually, that it was a cenotaph, or it was just a memorial to Samuel. Uh, when I looked on Find a Grave, it said that Samuel was actually buried at Corinth National Cemetery. Two years ago, my family and I traveled to Shiloh and also visited the, the Corinth Cemetery, and we could not find any record of Samuel being buried there. So when I got back home from vacation, I started to do, to do some research and through some digital archives, um, digital newspaper archives, I was able to find a newspaper article that talked about Samuel's body being transported back home 
by train so that he could be buried in Washington. So I was excited to learn that, you know, his burial actually was at this small local cemetery. And it's a local cemetery I'd visited since I was a kid. And it's a cemetery that we decorate annually on Memorial Day. Um, and to know that that was his resting place was really a big deal. I had seen a digital copy of this image online for several years prior, and I had reached out to the owner of the image uh, before I knew that Samuel was buried back home. And the owner, or the caretaker of the image, had decided at that time he wanted to hold on to it. And to his credit, uh, I reached back out to him when I learned that Samuel was actually buried back here, and he decided that you know, he would sell me the image and, and that I could be the caretaker. So we both agreed that bringing the image back home to Washington County was the right thing to do. And I'm very appreciative of him for that. The image in the bottom right corner is that of Robert Nelson. And I like this image because Robert um, served in Company F of the 11th Iowa, which was the same unit that my three times great grandfather served in. Now, the interesting thing is when I bought this image, I purchased purchased it from a dealer uh, on their online website. And it was unidentified at that time. It just had a Washington, Iowa back mark, but I believed it was a local soldier because of the back mark, so I went ahead and bought it. And I have a friend who's a, has a large collection of Iowa Civil War images. And I asked him, I said, do you happen to have any images of Company F, 11th Iowa soldiers? Not suspecting that this soldier was one of them. And he said, yeah, I, I do actually, I have one. And he took a picture of it and he sent me a copy of the picture. And lo and behold, it was an identified image of Robert Nelson. So I was excited, you know, that I was able to identify this image. And Robert Nelson, unfortunately, has a tragic story as well. He served his three years with Company F of the 11th Iowa. He decided not to reenlist. Um, he was he decided he was done serving and, and he was going to go back home with his family. And so he got on a train, was headed back home and the train that he was on collided head on with another train that was bound uh, for the south and was loaded down with cattle uh, with cattle and cattle cars and uh, headed to help with the war effort. And unfortunately, Robert Nelson lost his life, not in combat, but on his way home after his three years service. So the question I get asked commonly is what was my motivation and my interest? And I really found an interest in the Civil War when I was a kid. Uh, at that time, Ken Burns' documentary came out, and it was on public television, and my grandfather recorded all of the episodes of the Ken Burns documentary, and when I would spend time at his house, we would watch those together, and it was at that time that my grandfather introduced me to this picture, which you see on the left, and it's supposed to be a picture of my great-great-great-grandfather, Elias G. Jackson. I was amazed at that time as a kid to understand that I had an ancestor that served in the Civil War and to have a picture of him was, was amazing. Uh, now, as I've gotten older and I've learned more about images and I've learned more about the uniforms and about the Civil War, I've, I've come to question, you know, is this really uh, who it says it is? Uh, my ancestor, Elias, was a sergeant in Company F, the 11th Iowa Infantry. And there just are some things that, now that I've learned about images that jump out to me. So what are some of the things that make me question whether this image is indeed my ancestor? All right, so the first thing that we see here is these buttons. We have collar buttons from false buttonholes. And these collar buttons are most indicative of what's called a mounted services jacket. And these jackets would have been worn by cavalry or artillerymen. And it's not outside of the realm of possibility that an infantryman like Elias could have worn this jacket but it's not necessarily likely. So the next thing we see is, we see this French pinfire revolver. Now, pinfire revolvers were used in the Civil War, uh, but they were most commonly used by cavalry soldiers. Now, you'll hear folks speak of props, and many times a, a photographer would have a prop. So they might have a gun uh, or a sword or, or different things that a soldier could be pictured with. So it's also a possibility that that this could be a prop, but we do know that cavalry soldiers carried these pinfire revolvers. So the next thing we see here is we see a saber and a cavalry belt and the cavalry saber. And when I first looked at this image, I just assumed that, well, he was an officer. He ended up being a second lieutenant later in the war. 
So it's probably an officer's sword that he's carrying. But as I learn more about images and I learn more about the Civil War, and no, it, it is not indeed a, an officer's sword, it's actually a cavalry saber. So the other thing we see here is there's a painted backdrop and it's, it's kind of hard to make out in this particular image. Uh, but the unique thing about this backdrop is I have seen it uh, in other places, but all of the images that I've found, which is just two so far, and both the images that I've found with this exact same backdrop, they're not identified. So we don't have any idea where it was taken. Uh, so unfortunately at this point in time, all signs point to this not being an image of my three times great grandfather. And as I collect images, one, one of the things that I take very seriously is making sure that the ID is correct. And as much as I would love for this to be my ancestor, uh, I would just as much want to prove that it's not as much as I would like to prove that it is, because I really don't want to change history and, and have my great grandchildren uh, continue to pass this image down as, as being an ancestor of theirs. So my search for images of my ancestors continues, as I just shared you that one of Elias G. Jackson, or supposedly Elias G. Jackson. Uh, part of the reason why I'm so interested in, in Civil War images and in Iowa Civil War images is because of the connection that I have. And this is a list of the ancestors that I have who served during the Civil War. Now, I am fortunate in that I have a cousin who currently is the caretaker of this particular uh, drawing uh, or uh, charcoal of my ancestor, Jonas Ray, who is a member of Company G, 9th Iowa Cavalry. This is a large portrait that was done post-war. Uh, most likely the, the artist took an original tintype image, and then this is the, the sketch that they did of that. I'm guessing that this original image was probably taken early war uh, because you can see the epaulets uh, on the shoulder or the shoulder scales uh, on Jonas Ray's uniform. And this picture was taken in front of a Benton Barracks backdrop in St. Louis, Missouri. So let's talk a little bit about different types of images. So during the war, uh, there were several different types of images. Uh, the very first uh, form of photography or, or very first image type was a daguerreotype and daguerreotypes were developed in 1839 and I get asked a lot well how can you tell the difference from one image type to another so the daguerreotype has a silver coating on copper and they're beautiful images if you've ever seen one in person but the unique thing about them is if, if you turn the image and, and look at it it gives you kind of a mirror uh, like look and it can either be looked at uh, as a positive image or a negative image, depending on how you turn it. But the best way to tell a daguerreotype from other, what we would call hard images, is just to move it back and forth and see that it's very reflective. If it's very reflective, chances are it's a daguerreotype. Uh, but then we can also flip around to the back, and if it's copper, then that's kind of a dead giveaway. So the next image type was what's called an ambrotype. And different than a daguerreotype, an ambrotype is actually on glass. Now, the picture that I'm showing here is a ruby ambrotype, and you can tell that it's a ruby ambrotype by the, by the red color. Uh, this image, this picture has been taken by holding the image up to the light, and then you can see that, you know, it's kind of a red, you know, negative. Uh, there also are clear ambrotypes, and those typically have a black finish on the back, or sometimes you'll get a piece of black material on the back um, with those images. So... Early in the war, there might've been a few daguerreotypes. They're very rare uh, to find a uh, Civil War image that's a daguerreotype. Uh, ambrotypes were fairly common early in the war, and then eventually they lost popularity to what we refer to today as, as tintypes or ferrotypes. And then the very last image uh, is what's called a carte de visite or a CDV. And the CDV image, uh, the photographer had the ability to make several copies. And these became very popular because soldiers could go and have one sitting, they could have their picture taken once, and then they could have multiple copies of that picture made from the original negative. And they use these almost as trading cards. So as the, as the name carte de visite uh, suggests, or CDV suggests, they're, they're a calling card. So they would almost trade these, you know, similar to baseball cards at the time. The, the thing that I like about the CDV images is that in many cases, they'll have a back mark. 
So that back mark will tell you where the image was taken. Uh, you also might find on the back a revenue stamp. And based on what type of revenue stamp it is, you know, you can determine uh, when that picture was taken. And probably the, the most exciting or interesting thing about CDV images is the inscription. So it's always great if you've got a nice, clear, you know, ink inscription, either on the front or the back of the image that can help identify the person that's in the picture. I'm asked frequently, what units did Washington County soldiers serve in, or what regiments were Washington County regiments? And really, in order to understand uh, how men enlisted or what units they were in, we really need to understand this unit organization. The truth is, men from Washington County, as an example, Washington County was a very rural area. And even though Washington County had upwards of 1,600 men who served in the Civil War, they never had enough men to form a full regiment. So this chart here from uh, battlefields.org, it shows how units were organized. So the largest uh, unit was an army. And then uh, you'll see then the regiment, you know, was the smallest unit. And even below a regiment then would have been a company. So your regiment would have a thousand men. So we'll use the example of my ancestor, Elias Jackson. Elias was a member of Company F of the 11th Iowa. And the 11th Iowa Infantry would have a thousand men. And that regiment was composed of 10 companies of 100 men. Company F in particular, that company was a Washington County company. So the vast majority of the men that joined Company F were from Washington County, Iowa. So unless uh, you were from a, a heavily populated area, chances are, you know, you had men from your particular county that were members of several different regiments. So again, we can see here, you know, the regiment, uh, it's led by a colonel. Uh, then we have a brigade that's led by a brigadier general and a division, a corps, and then on down to the army. I'm fairly new to collecting images. And uh, I'll admit, there are, are a lot of things I still have to learn, but I've been thankful that I've had a lot of folks who've helped me along the way. And I feel like in, in my image collecting infancy, I've probably found the, the holy grail for my collecting you know, lifetime. Um, and, and this is the story of you know, the photo composite company C-19th Iowa Infantry. And it all started last February uh, when I purchased an image off of eBay and it led to uh, me having the opportunity to bring this amazing photo composite back home. And I feel like it's, it's probably the most treasured uh, part of my collection today. And uh, I'll be sharing some more information about this composite now, just to kind of give you a, a feel for how it all happened. You know, how did it all start? So last February, I purchased this image of William C. Porter off of eBay. And I was really interested in this image and was hoping to win it uh, because William C. Porter was in Company C, the 19th Iowa. Uh, Company C were all men who were in Washington County at the time of their enlistment. So they were a Washington County unit with several names that I recognized. And my wife's three time, uh, three times great grandfather, Marshall Wilkin, was actually a member of this unit. So I was really excited to win the image. And uh, when I did get the image home, I started paying attention to just some of the other small things that I hadn't noticed previously. Uh, the one thing that I noticed was at the top of the William C. Porter image is his name, and, but there's a number that's in front of it uh, as if it was a key or this number was used to identify the image. And then also you'll notice on the back are some glue marks. So I could tell that this image had probably been attached or affixed to something else at some point in time. So I sent a message to the eBay seller asking her, hey, do you happen to know where this image came from originally and was it part of a larger collection? And I was amazed, um, almost fell out of my seat when the seller informed me that this image came from a large photo composite of Company C of the 19th Iowa and that she still indeed had that composite. She was planning on selling some of the images off individually and this was actually the second image that she had taken from that particular composite and sold. 
So after negotiating with the seller, um, I convinced her that keeping the piece together in its entirety was the right thing to do. Um, it, it just needed, for historical reasons, it needed to be kept together. And I felt pretty strongly that this particular composite needed to come back home to Washington County. So this all started in February of last year and the seller was located in Virginia. And she told me that she would be attending what's called the Show of Shows, a military show in Louisville, Kentucky in July. So we made arrangements to drive to Louisville, Kentucky to pick up the photo composite. So the day after our local county fair, my son and I loaded up in the car and we headed south to Louisville. And you can see here a picture of my son, Caden, holding this photo composite. Now it's kind of hard to see from this image, but you'll notice there are, are several blank areas around the outside. So around the outside of that composite, there are some places where there used to be CDV images, but those images were now gone. Uh, the seller had those images. They were loose and, and in an envelope when I purchased this composite. Now, so how is this composite put together? And if you'll remember back to my opening slide, there was an image there of a young soldier. Uh, he was seated and he had a dragoon, a Colt dragoon a revolver tucked into his belt. And it just so happens that that soldier was John W. Morton. And John W. Morton was a member of Company C of the 19th Iowa. And in June of 1882, he made plans to assemble this photo composite. So he reached out to his comrades. He sent them letters via snail mail. Uh, he also posted in the newspaper, which you can see here from the June 1882 Washington Democrat. So John W. Morton posts in the newspaper. He sends out letters. He says, hey, guys, send me your picture and I'm going to put together a large photo. And that's exactly what he did. So for the next year and a half or two years, Morton collected those images. And then he had an artist sketch uh, kind of a beautiful scene in the background. It's a graphite sketch. Uh, there's a camp scene. Uh, there's a farm scene. I uh, sketched this all out and then he took those images and he arranged them uh, nicely on a large photo board. Then once that original composite was completed, he had a facsimile copy made that measured 18 by 22 inches. Now this is an example of the facsimile copy and the interesting thing about this story or what I guess made it very exciting for me was I was aware of this facsimile copy. I had seen this facsimile copy shared on Facebook on the Prairie Grove uh, Battlefield State Park page, the Friends of Prairie Grove. And in that photo composite uh, is a picture of Marshall Wilkin, who would be my wife's three times great grandfather. So I'd seen this composite before, but I was astonished when I talked to the seller to realize that you know, she had the original that this facsimile copy was made from. So Morton makes facsimile copies and he sells them. And uh, this is a, a copy or a picture of the facsimile that's at Prairie Grove Battlefield State Park. And most recently, I learned that our local uh, museum or historical society here in Washington actually has one of these facsimile copies in their collection as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing that in person. So through that uh, story, which was kind of exciting and, and it caught the attention of other folks within the image collecting community, uh, I was asked and and I accepted immediately uh, to write an article for Military Images Magazine. And so this is a, a picture of that article, which was featured in the December uh, 2021 uh, edition of Military Images. So this is a high resolution scan of the piece in its entirety. So we know that these CDV images that are around the border of the composite, those were added after uh, quite, a, quite a few years after this composite was first assembled. So you can see the sketches there in the background. We have some, you know, some flags and drums up in the top left and right corner. Down in the bottom left is a camp scene where you can see the stacked arms. And I'm sure my video is kind of blocking it here, but in the bottom right corner is a picture of a farmstead and it shows some, some tools that are laid down on the ground. And my assumption is that this is kind of portraying the fact that these were citizen soldiers. 90% uh, of the men who enlisted in Company C 19th Iowa, they were farmers at the time of their enlistment. So I think this is just demonstrating that those men laid their tools down to go fight in the war. Uh, in the center of the composite are the, 
the main officers of this particular unit. And then around the border, the CDV images, we assume were added sometime in the early 1900s. In the bottom left, you can see a half tone or a newspaper clipping of John Bruce. And it talks about John Bruce's death. Uh, so we know that these were added sometime after Bruce passed away. Now, unfortunately, if you look on the left-hand side of the composite and you count down one, two, three, four images down from the top on the left, that is an image of James Young. That is the only image that I do not have uh, that's part of this original composite. So when we put this article together for military images, we use what was called a digital surrogate. So basically we photoshopped a copy of the James Young image into this composite. Unfortunately, the James Young image sold on eBay about two weeks before I was able to buy the William C. Porter image. And that James Young image sold to the Prairie Grove Battlefield State Park. And so it's now in their collection. Uh, so it's all together, uh, except for the one image which we're missing there on the left. So this just kind of continues to go through the story of the photo composite. Uh, on the page there on the left, you can see two different images of John W. Morton. Uh, there's the older picture of Morton that was post-war. That's probably most likely what he looked like at the time that he assembled this photo composite. And then on the left is an image of John W. Morton uh, as a corporal. Again, just the end of uh, the last page here of the article. And if you are interested in looking at this article, if you do not have a subscription to Military Images, you can simply do a Google search, search for Company C, 19th Iowa, and Military Images. Uh, the article should come up, and you actually have the ability to get one free article on Military Images before it takes you to a, to a paywall. So you'd have the ability to look at this uh, article online if you would have interest. But I would encourage you to, to get a subscription to Military Images if you have any interest in Civil War images at all. It's just a fantastic publication. And we will be featuring Iowa soldiers in the December 2022 issue. Uh, you could also do a Google search and, and look for this interview that I did uh, with KCRG uh, TV9, which is a local news station here in Southeast Iowa. I was fortunate to be asked to, to do an interview with them the night before Thanksgiving. And the amazing thing was, I, I besides just having some good positive um, news and publicity, shortly after this, this aired on our local news station, I was contacted by a local man who said, hey, I have some belongings of John W. Morton's, some personal belongings that I think you might be interested in. And uh, he showed up in my house a few days later, and I was astonished when he showed up with not one, but two different tintype images of John W. Morton. Not only did he have two tintype images of Morton, he also had John W. Morton's Bible, uh, which is inscribed by Morton. Uh, and it says in, in the inscription that he carried the Bible with him all the way through the war. So I feel very fortunate to be the caretaker of not only this amazing photo composite that John W. Morton put together, but also I'm now the caretaker of two fantastic images of Morton as well as his Bible. The interesting thing is when I wrote the article about Company C 19th Iowa for military images, I had seen a copy of the John W. Morton image where he has the Colt Dragoon in his belt. I had seen a copy of that image online, a digital copy. It was posted on Find a Grave and several other websites, and I was not able to track down who the owner was. Well, it's my belief that Morton probably made some CDV copies of that tintype that had been distributed. And all along, the original tintype had been right here in my small hometown, which is just terribly ironic to me, but, but really amazing in its own right. It's very easy when we're talking about the Civil War uh, to stereotype things or, or go off of what we've always been taught, um, the blue versus the gray. Uh, but the reality is there was a whole menagerie of different uniforms at the beginning of the war, and especially here in Iowa. And uh, we actually had quite a few uniforms that were gray. And you can see the image here of Henry C. Dara on the left. And Henry was a member of the 1st Iowa Infantry and a member of the Governor's Grays. And the Governor's Grays were a militia group uh, that was formed prior to the beginning of the Civil War. 
and they had these frock coats that you can see here. Now, the frock that's pictured in the center, that is actually in the collection of the State Historical Society in Des Moines. Now, it's the, the material has changed over time and it's it's kind of turned into more of a butternut color, but by all descriptions, it actually was more of a gray. Now, the image on the right was one that was shared on our Iowa Civil War Images group that I don't think many people had ever seen before. Uh, being able to find first Iowa infantry images is really difficult because they were just a three months regiment, uh, so they didn't serve for very long. Um, and I think a lot of these images have probably ended up in the hands of Confederate uh, image collectors who think that they're Confederates, you know, due to the way the, the uniforms are designed or the way that they look. But this image of Bernard Reinhardt, we know Reinhardt was a soldier in the first Iowa. And when we read this description of their uniform, I think it fits to a T. Uh, as it says here, it consists of a light blouse with green collar and patent leather belt, dark gray pants without stripe, except in case of officers, a black felt hat turned up at one side, fastened by a tin bullseye the size of a sauce plate, which displays the red, white, and blue. The whole makes a soldier look not unlike a popperized cart man. The same general style has been adopted by the Burlington companies and that at Mount Pleasant, except that the others revel in a profusion of red flannel trimmings. The whole rig from hat to brogan costs $8 and is as unhandsome as cheap, although comfortable. This description in my mind fits what Bernard Reinhardt is wearing here to a T. Now, the only difference is the collar and the cuffs of this particular tunic that he's wearing. They appear more black in this image, but this image has been hand colored by the artist. So it's possible that maybe the, the artist, you know, through their interpretation, you know, maybe colored those areas black, you know, versus a green. But from the felt hat, you know, turned up on one side to so the description of the uniform itself, it really fits to a T. Um, Iowa soldiers, at, at least the ones in the first Iowa, you know, they they had same, similar colored uniforms, but they were different in design. And Governor Samuel Kirkwood, he sent someone to Chicago to buy material to make these uniforms. And then local groups got together to sew the uniforms for the soldiers. And it was kind of a gray satinette material. But some of the soldiers ended up with green trim and some ended up with red trim or piping. So they all had the same general color, but the overall design of the uniforms was, was very different. And in the early years of the war, um, Iowa troops really struggled to have, you know, the right equipment and uniforms to take the field with. So other, other unique uniforms, I guess, as I talked about earlier, Samuel M. Rickey, he was a member of Company H of the 7th Iowa, and the seventh Iowa wore what's called a New York State jacket. So on the left, uh, that's Samuel Rickey. And then on the right is George Logan. And you can read here the description below the picture uh, of a modern, that's a modern reproduction of a New York State jacket. But the description reads as follows. While at Bird's Point, the regiment was uniformed for the first time. For some reason, which I never understood, our regiment's first uniform was different from any other and was not a regulation suit. It consisted of a dark blue jacket with light blue trimmings, light blue pants, and fatigue cap, a sort of zouave outfit. At Corinth, we wore the Scotch Glengarry, same as the 12th Illinois, which distinguished us from other commands. After this was worn out, we drew the regulation uniform, which we continued to wear all through the rest of our service. The interesting thing here is they talk about being issued their uniforms at Bird's Point. And I'm just looking at my notes here now, but these men enlisted in, in the 7th Iowa Infantry in August of 1861, and they were not at Bird's Point until the middle of October of 1861. And there are several different accounts where it discusses these men leaving home, they were not uniformed. Uh, so it's really pretty amazing that they, they left with basically what they had uh, from home at that time. The image on the right is an image of George A. Logan, and George A. Logan was a member of Company H of the 7th Iowa Infantry as well. And George was unfortunately killed at the Battle of Belmont. And the, the Brighton, Iowa GAR post is actually named after George Logan. I had someone recently reach out to me from the Sons of the Iowa Sons of Union Civil War veterans, and he was wondering about the monument that's in the Brighton, Iowa Cemetery, because it's a monument uh, dedicated to the, the Civil War soldiers from the area, 
but it's uh the portrayal is that of a zoov soldier and it it almost makes me wonder if maybe someone read this account of the regiment and they decided to use kind of a stock or standard zoov type soldier uh, for that particular monument as kind of a an ode to George A. Logan and the 7th Iowa Infantry. The fatigue blouse or sack coat is the uniform that we most commonly associate with Western federal soldiers. And as you can see here, this is a picture of David D. Cummings of Company B of the 10th Iowa Infantry. The thing I love about this image of Cummings is He's got a really neat hat. That's a, I think what they would refer to as a pork pie hat. So a civilian hat that he purchased on his own. But the other thing you can notice is inside uh, the pocket of his sack coat, you can see what I'm guessing is either a diary or, or a Bible, uh, but really pretty neat. So why do they call it the sack coat? Well, the main reason they called it a sack coat is because in many cases, it fit just like a sack, as if you would just cut a hole in the top and, and put it over yourself. Now I can understand why soldiers would want to wear a New York state jacket or a frock coat because they look really official, but there's no doubt that the sack coat was probably the most comfortable uh, of the uniform options that the soldiers had. So if they were on campaign, they're marching you know, several miles every day, uh, I think the sack coat would pro probably be the preferred uh, coat to wear. But as I look at images, I'm actually surprised at the lack of soldiers pictured wearing sack coats. And this is a great example here uh, of an original sack coat. When we think of Western uh, Civil War soldiers or federal soldiers, we really think about them wearing primarily the, the four button sack coat or fatigue blouse. But as we've started to collect images on the Iowa Civil War Images Facebook group, I've really been surprised at the number of soldiers that are wearing what's referred to as the federal issue dress coat or the nine button frock coat. And that jacket is pictured here. Now I can understand why the soldiers want to wear this. It, it really is probably the most official looking or most soldierly looking uniform. Uh, but as is described here in the, in the caption below this frock coat, they also refer to them as the sweat box. And I have a frock coat of my own. And it, although it looks very sharp uh, in hot weather, I couldn't imagine you know marching around in it. So I, I really don't know, you know, did these soldiers uh, wear them in combat? I'm sure they had both. They had a, a frock coat and a sack coat, um, but it's obvious that they wanted to be pictured in these frock coats. And when we get some more images collected on the Iowa Civil War Images Facebook group, my plan is to do a little research and, and go through and start to categorize all these images. And I'm just curious how many images really do picture soldiers in a frock coat, but here are a, a couple of great examples of, of soldiers uh, wearing their nine button frock coat. It's always exciting to find images of soldiers with a core badge. Uh, where I collect images of Iowa Civil War soldiers, it's probably not as common to see the core badges because they're, they're mainly associated with the Eastern troops. Uh, but the core badges were first introduced by General Philip Kearney in June of 1862. And in many cases, those Eastern troops, they might have the core badge stitched onto their uniform, or they might have a metal core badge affixed to their hat. Um, but Eastern troops in the Army of the Potomac, they first sported them on the left side of their hat or their breast. So it was very common with those Eastern troops. And uh, for the Western troops, one of the most common or iconic, I guess, or recognizable uh, core badges is that of the 15th Corps. And I always like the story and uh, so the story of how the core badge was developed, it, it goes something like this, and you'll see it here in the caption, but there were some 12th Corps soldiers and their core badge is the star. And there was, some, there was a 15th Corps soldier who happened to be an Irishman sitting around a campfire with these 12th Corps soldiers. And they asked him, you know, what, what Corps you know, are you with? And, and he respond, responded, the 15th Corps. And they said, what is your badge? And his response was, why? He grabs his cartridge box, 40 rounds in the cartridge box, and 20 in the pocket. And so that story just kind of stuck. Uh, and it was after that that they developed the core badge uh, for the 15th Corps around that. You know, it, it's a picture of a cartridge box like this that I'm holding, and it says 40 rounds. So 
those 40 rounds badges are are some of the coolest ones i think in in the entire civil war now i just got done telling you that the 15th corps badge is one of the most iconic and really one of my favorite uh corps badges but i do have a soft spot for the 17th corps as my ancestor that fought with the 11th iowa infantry was part of the 17th corps uh, these are a couple great images of some members of the 11th Iowa Infantry. On the left is William, Sergeant William Fultz, who is from Muscatine. And Fultz actually wrote a great regimental history about the 11th Iowa. And after I transcribed this history, uh, I found this, this image of Fultz online. And the awesome thing about this image is Fultz has actually taken three of these arrow badges, the 17th Corps badges, and he's laid them on top of each other. Now, there's some people who speculate that maybe um, each of the arrows is a different color. We can't tell that from this image, but if indeed that's the case, the idea or the thought process is that each one of the arrows being a different color to represent the three different divisions of the 17th Corps. So, you know, there might be a red one, a white one, and a blue one. So we don't know that for sure, but still pretty neat. Uh, and then you can also see Fultz is wearing either a Sherman badge or an ID disc above. On the right is an image of Isaac Carr. This is another image that was taken in Louisville. And I've mentioned before, the soldiers at Louisville were really decked out. And you could see this jacket uh, that Isaac Carr is wearing. It's a private purchase jacket. He's got a great vest underneath. But the thing that really jumps out to me is on his hat. And you have to look closely. If you don't know what you're looking for, you'll probably miss it. But I've zoomed in here and you can look at Isaac Carr's hat. And on that hat, you can see the 17th Corps badge. So really neat you know if you come across images where maybe the soldier is not identified at least if if there weren't a core badge you can narrow it down to the core so i uh these are two of my favorite images because i love the 11th iowa and i just i love that 17th core badge so as i mentioned earlier the the 15th core badge is really one of the the most unique and, and probably iconic core badges of the war and this image of corporal william emmett flesher on the left is really neat because you can see that he's wearing not just one, uh, but two different 15th Corps badges. Now, as, it, as you'll read here in the caption, the 15th Corps badge was a shield with a cartridge box in the middle with the Corps motto, 40 rounds. The color of the shield indicated the division, first division with red, second division white, third division blue, and the fourth division was yellow. And I'd have to go back and review my notes, but, um, Flesher was a member of the 10th Iowa Infantry, and I believe they were part of the 1st and the 2nd Division of the 15th Corps at different periods of time during the war. So I almost wonder if those two Corps badges might not be different colors. You know, did Flesher, did he buy two Corps badges that were the same, or did he have a Corps badge uh, from the two different divisions that they were a part of? If you frequent in the uh, Iowa Civil War Images Facebook group, you've probably seen several pictures where the soldiers are wearing this uh, eagle hanger, as is pictured here, with a medal hanging below it or a medallion. And it's really hard, unfortunately, to tell from some of the pictures. Is it an ID disc? So on the left, you'll see the eagle hanger, gold eagle hanger, and on the back, uh, there's a name. So soldiers frequently wore these ID discs with their names and their unit on the back. Uh, but they looked very similar in appearance, especially in old uh, images like these CDV images. They look very similar in appearance to uh, what's also called the Sherman badge or the Army of Georgia badge. And I'm fortunate actually to have, uh, if you can see it here, I'm fortunate to actually have an Army of Georgia or Sherman badge in my collection. Uh, it's hanging on a reproduction hanger, uh, but the medallion itself is the original. So you'll see the picture here of a Massa Cheney on the left of the 13th Iowa. He has the, the arrow above, which is the 17th Corps badge, and he's wearing what's called a private purchase sack coat. So this was a late war image of Cheney, and it's very common for us to see soldiers wearing really nice outfits late in the war. Uh, Cheney was pictured here in Louisville, and then the image on the right, very similar uh the soldier's picture with kind of a private purchase vest underneath his his private purchase sack coat and both of the men are wearing this eagle hanger with either an id disc or the sherman badge 
One other unique aspect of images are these Lincoln mourning cockades and ribbons. So on the left, you'll see First Lieutenant James H. Miller of Indianola, Iowa, and he has what's called a, a Lincoln mourning cockade. On the right is an image from my collection and that of Sergeant James Dungan. And James Dungan actually wrote the regimental history just a few months at, after the end of the war. And he's actually uh, one of the CDV images that's around the border of my photo composite. You can faintly make out on Dungan's sleeve, which I've zoomed in on here in the top right corner, you can faintly make out uh, the ribbon that Dungan is wearing. The interesting thing about James Dungan is he's, he's wearing this mourning ribbon in support of Abraham Lincoln, um, but Dungan does get involved in politics after the war, and he actually uh, is a Democrat um, after the Civil War. One of the probably the neatest and most unique things about uh, images are these painted backdrops. And these are three different pictures of three different soldiers uh, that were taken in front of a Benton barracks painted backdrop. Now, the interesting thing is the image on the left is an unidentified soldier in front of a Benton barracks backdrop. And if you look closely at that black uh, bag that's there, that's his knapsack. And on the knapsack, you can faintly see the words USA. And in the background, you can see the stacked uh, rifles or the stacked muskets. And there's a cartridge box there. And you can also see USA. Now, these backdrops were actually painted backwards. So these backdrops were intended to be used with hard images. So with either tintype or ambrotype images. Now, a, a tintype or an ambrotype image would be reversed. So the artist would paint these backdrops on what I'm assuming is a big canvas or a big piece of cloth. They would paint them backwards so that when the picture was taken, it would be flipped around to look correctly. Now, the image in the center of Andrew Johnson, you'll notice it's the same background, it's the same backdrop, but if we look now at the knapsack, on the knapsack in the picture, the USA is backwards. Uh, the muskets that are stacked in the background, it also has US on it, and that's backwards as well. The image is flipped. So this is probably a later war picture uh, that Andrew Johnson had taken, and since it's a carte de visite, that image is it's not reversed it's not flipped like you would see in the tin type or the ambro type so this is a good way for us to be able to tell you know when this was taken likely it was taken mid to late war uh, because of the image type it's a cdv uh, and also you can tell that that backdrop was intended to be used with hard images so i've done some research very limited research on iowa civil war images and painted backdrops, but it's just not something that we see commonly uh, with Iowa Civil War images. So the image on the left is that of Colonel Benjamin Crabb. Crabb is actually a hotel owner uh, in Washington, Iowa at the time of the war. He first enlisted in Company H of the 7th Iowa, who we've talked a lot about today. Crabb started out in Company H, 7th Iowa. He was wounded at Belmont. Uh, he was captured uh, at the Battle of Belmont, and then later he was paroled and at that time he had some injuries, so he was discharged for those injuries. Then he later uh, joined up uh, with the 19th Iowa and ended up serving as the Colonel of the 19th Iowa Infantry. This picture was taken in the William Dudley studio in Washington, Iowa. And I actually have a few different images of Company C 19th Iowa soldiers with that same backdrop. And then the image on the right is an unidentified soldier uh, in, in front of a Camp Hendershot background. Pretty, pretty cool image. If you look closely at his boots, you'll see that it must have been muddy that day. And he came into the studio uh, probably through some mud because his, dudes, his boots look pretty dirty. So hairstyles, I, I get a lot of comments sometimes about the hairstyles. You know, the thing I enjoy the most about collecting images is it just brings that period of time to light. And it really goes to show that these men weren't all that much different than us today. And I'll be the first one to admit, I would love to have the hair of any of these gentlemen here. Um, and they're just not the kind of hairstyles that you typically would expect to see during this time period. Now, there have been reports of, of areas that have been excavated. So maybe old campsites 
where folks know that a photographer had a studio set up and as archaeologists have excavated those sites, it's not uncommon for them to find bottles that contained hair styling products. Uh, pomade would have been a popular hair styling product at that time and even uh, hair dye. So these men were spending a lot of money to have their picture taken and they were sending them home to their families or to their sweethearts. And unfortunately, in, in some cases, like the case of James Matthews, it may have been the last image or the only image of them that was ever taken. So they wanted to make sure that they you know, were looking their best. Uh, the center image there of James Matthews uh, is a copy of an original. If you look at the picture closely, you can see the oval shape of probably what was originally the preserver of a tintype image. And then that tintype image was turned into a memorial image uh, CDV copy. You also see some other neat things uh, like tools and, and other elements that if you look closely, uh, you might find. Uh, the image on the right is that of William Reeves and Reeves was a member of the Iowa Cavalry. And I'm going off the top of my head, I, I think he was a member of the first or the second Iowa Cavalry. But the neat thing about Reeves is that he was the farrier. So his job was to take care of, of shoeing the horses. And if you look closely at this image, he has a revolver tucked into his belt, but he also has the most important tool of his trade, which was his farrier's hammer. Now, if we look at the image of Henry Shaver, this is one that we, we saw earlier on my first slide. And if you look closely, it looks to me like Shaver may have a pipe, you know, kind of tucked into, I don't know if he's got it tucked into his pocket or it's just resting there against uh, his cap pouch, but it sure looks to me like he has a pipe there that's similar to the one that's, that's pictured here. Now, I thought I'd give a little uh, blurb here about the Iowa Civil War Images Facebook group. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's a part of the group and for their active participation. Uh, I started this group over Christmas break uh, while I had a little bit of extra time. And I really just wanted to have a place where I could compile all the images and have a way to, to kind of keep the memory of these men alive. And my hope was that folks would join the group and maybe they would find an image of someone in their family that they've been looking for for years. And in just a couple, two, three short months, I've been fortunate that some family members have reached out to me to let me know that, hey, uh, you found an image of, of my ancestor that I'd never seen before. And so I, I get asked frequently, well, where do the images come from? And I've been fortunate enough to befriend a, a couple of uh, two or three great collectors uh, of Iowa images. And a couple of those gentlemen have decided to, they'd like to remain anonymous, uh, but they have been kind enough to allow me to photograph their images and share them online. And I also have other places where I go to look for images. Uh, if you go on worthpoint.com, worthpoint, they collect information from online auctions and sales. So they have a database where they've, they've saved a lot of sales uh, that have occurred over eBay uh, over the years. So I'm able to find images there. I also spend some time on the Civil War photo sleuth and I'll, I'll save some images from that as well. So the way that I have a Civil War images group works currently, each week we have a theme and I'm trying to go through each one of the units in chronological order. So this week uh, we've been focusing on the, the 6th Iowa Infantry and I like to share the, the images individually so folks can see you know, the stories of each of the men. And then at the end of the week, I take those images and I put them in an album on the Facebook group so that you can search uh, by unit. I really believe that once we get through all the units, we'll probably have somewhere north of 2000 Iowa Civil War images shared. So I just, I want to thank everyone that's participating. I'm really amazed at the amount of members that we have. Uh, right now we have over 1200 members. And if you look there, we have members from, I think it's about 10 different countries uh, and, and really kind of a, a broad group, uh, almost evenly split between men and women and, and a pretty broad group demographically as well. When we originally agreed to do the Zoom presentation today, uh, it was to be kind of a, a warm up for an in-person presentation that we have scheduled with the EV History Center in August. So again, my apologies that things didn't work out today with the presentation and for everything that happened, but I hope that for those folks that live locally, uh, we can see you in person on August the 7th of this year 
at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I'll have my son with me and I hope that uh, maybe you can bring some pictures that we can help identify or we can help uh, you learn more about uh, what maybe you have. Or if you have interest in learning about an ancestor, uh, my son Kate and I would both be happy to help you do some research and, and who knows, maybe we can find a picture. So we were gonna do this live, but as I mentioned earlier, we had someone sabotage our, our Zoom uh, presentation. I guess we'll probably uh, blame it on the Russians, but like the Ukrainians, we're gonna continue to, to fight on and we're not gonna let them get the best of us. So at this time, I, I can't take your questions live, but I do plan on posting this video to YouTube. And I would encourage you to feel, feel free to, to put your questions in the comments there and I'll try to get back with you or you can always send me a message directly on Facebook. So with that, thank you very much for your time. My apologies for what happened earlier. Uh, it was out of our control and very unfortunate, but I'm glad that we could find a way to make this happen. Thank you.